All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to another episode of the Dota Procast podcast. I am Breaky CPK, as always, of course, joined by Elevated as my co-host. And once again, we got uh, some stuff to talk about when it comes to competitive Dota 2 and excited to be here. So hopefully you guys are excited as well. Welcome to the show. Elevated, how you doing, man? Good, man. It's uh, it's pretty hot where I am, but I think that's oh, the yeah? case for everywhere in the U.S. from what I'm hearing. Uh, but other than that, other than just sweating, sweaty in my room. <laughs> okay. Don't got AC up in there? I mean, is, is it broken or what's the deal, man? Well, there's no there's no AC in houses in Oregon, so ah, you know, it, you just gotta, in, in Oregon yeah. really it gets it gets hot up there. That seems like it's a cool a cold state to me for some reason. I might be wrong. That's why there's no AC. And <laughs> when it gets hot, then you Fair gotta enough. suffer. It, like you said, it's the same thing everywhere. So uh, obviously we're here to talk competitive Dota two. In case you haven't tuned in any of our shows just yet, the Dota Procast. That's what we're all about, talking about competitive Dota 2 specifically. Ideally, it's a weekly show, us to host it, and every once in a while, we'll have a guest on even. Speaking of that, we got a pretty cool guest on that'll be joining us in about a half an hour from now. The one, the only, PPD, a.k.a. Peter Van Dam from Optic Gaming currently. Going to be joining us uh, to talk not only about Optic, but uh, about the NADCL. You may be asking yourself, what's that? Well, we'll talk more about it later on when we have him on, of course, but it's a pretty cool idea. A new league of sorts in North America that uh, he is actually heading up, essentially, moving Much forward. Needed. Yeah, I think that uh, we both agree there, and obviously a reason why he's uh, bringing it in. So we'll get plenty more information on that, uh, as well, of course, Optic. Uh, but today's show, specifically, we're also going to be previewing a couple more teams from TI8. Uh, something, of course, for TI8. It's still a little bit away, but uh, as the shows advance on, we'll ideally cover a region a week, or maybe a couple, depending on which one they are. This week, we're going to focus on the best, of course, North America. I'm sure there's no dispute there whatsoever, but there will be the three teams, Optic Gaming, EG, and VGJ Storm. We'll just kind of take a look, see what their season was like, uh, recap, and all the moves that they went through when it came to roster. Because all three of those teams had had a bit of roster changes throughout the season, you might remember. So, um, But before all of that, we will start with the Summer Cup that recently finished up right here. So, uh, But you ready to get into it, Elevated? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I... I didn't actually get to watch a whole lot of the Summer Cup, so I spent some time looking at the matches uh, in just in the last couple of days. Mm -hmm. And it looks like uh, there's some... I mean, there's still good Dota going on, and thankfully to BTS, we still have some actual tournaments going on before TI actually happens, so... Yeah. This is one of those cases... I mean, the Summit event itself, which obviously we'll kind of preview a little bit right now, uh, that was what this was for, a qualifier for the Summit event, but that was kind of the ultimate idea, I think, from BTS was, like you just said, because with this null phase now of the TIA qualifiers finishing up, TIA itself is still, at this point, more than a month away. Let's have something in between. And we got the Summer Cup as a reason. Both of those regions entering the event, and ultimately one team qualifying for the big ticket that was to go fly out to Southern California and compete at the Summit 9 tournament. One of six teams, which again we'll talk about shortly as well, that'll be at the event. But for this one, let's do it, a.k.a. the former Kingwin squad defeated Wind and Rain in a pretty solid best of five going the distance. Ultimately taking it, though, so let's do it. Taking the Summer Cup home. Win and rain. A lot of people would have expected them, especially with their decent success out of the European qualifiers, ultimately losing to OG, of course, but looked pretty good. Uh, let's do it, though. Dropping the Kingo name and uh, coming in strong to this event. Yeah, I kind of wonder if Kingwin, the sponsor, is kicking themselves a little bit because <laughs> usually it's like after TI qualifiers are over, then all the sponsors you don't have a you know real solid team usually a team that didn't qualify for TI just yeah. kind of end up like dropping the rosters and then next season, maybe they'll pick up another one. But uh, I mean, this team, like they're, they're qualifying for a tournament that's going to get, you know, decent exposure. And so I, I wonder, I just wonder if the Kingwin people who are kind of managing the Dota team are a little bit, a little bit salty about the fact that their team is now, you know, having some success. That, 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 that was one of my first thoughts as well, not going to lie. And it, it is a case of, I mean, yes, yeah, so especially, again, only being one of six teams at an event like Semo where everyone's going to have their eyes on that watch as competitive Dota 2 before we have TI8 here. 
Yeah, it's it's. I'm sure it's a little unfortunate for them, but it did sound like it was kind of just at the end of the contract, anyways. It, there was no like bad blood or anything. It was just simply, all right, your contract's up. The season officially ended. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and you know drop you or not resign you. I think it's a better way to say it because that's essentially what happened. They didn't drop them necessarily. They just didn't resign them. Now there was there was kind of some some really just kind of feel good news that like, did come out of it. it. Apparently, they let them use their computer still and everything for this event on top of that. So they were actually, uh, they, they were still kind of boot camping in a sense or playing from the Kingwin uh, team house, I guess, and uh, to compete for this event, and they ended up qualifying in the end. So they, they still got a little bit of a shout out there, a little bit of love as they deserve, no doubt, but uh, let's do it again. The, these guys, this is a team that looks so good early on in the season when you when you look at uh, how things were shaping up, and this was one of the scariest squads at a year up. Uh, at the earlier point, but had a really weak finish, didn't really perform either at the TIA qualifiers, and, you know, ultimately kind of just died off. But it's also a team that's been around forever. I mean, this they go back to last season even. I want to say they they've were been... Singularity before, I think, weren't they? Uh, they might have been. Like... Alternate attacks, I know they were okay. at one point as well. Uh, but, yeah, the Polish squad that is, they've uh, they've been around a while, at least two years now. That, to me, is something special, if anything. The, the fact that they can stick together as five players, ultimately, and play together for so long is a pretty cool trait. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the only, the only other team that I can think of that really was like that was uh, Ad Finum. And yeah. they, were, they were kind of the same, where they were sort of like a, a Tier 3, Tier 2 European team for a while, and they stuck together and then started to have a little bit more success. And obviously, they had that one um, you know, great run at the Major in Boston and some more success after that. Um, and it was just one of those things where it's kind of like they had to build up over the course of a year plus of playing together and, you know, being together, developing the chemistry. And so it is cool to see teams sticking together, uh, especially since we're going to be getting into some heavy roster shuffling teams later on in the show. Yeah, definitely. Um, Wind and Rain, talking about them for a second, as we kind of mentioned already. I mean, obviously, they got to the finals. Up into the grand finals, they only dropped one game between the groups and the playoff stage. They lost one game to Espada in the first round, but they actually 2 0 let's do it, in the winter finals to even get to the grand finals in the first place. But, of course, in the best of five that was, there's no advantages, as always. Simply put, you just didn't have to play on the loser side. Well, they came up short. They, they actually were down to nothing and ended up tying the series. But you look at that game, too, especially, an 80-minute victory on the yeah. side of let's do it. Now, I mean, that's a game that definitely could have gone out of the way, especially when you have a Spectre on your team going that long of a game. So, you know, just make you think, like, when it rained, they just win that 80-minute game. Obviously, they could just as easily be going – to Southern California, but uh, that's that's not how it is in the end. Obviously, let's do it, Victoria. So, yeah, so I mean, and, and the thing about let's do it or Kingwin, or I think they're even tagged up as new guys <laughs> in in the actual official game. Mm -hmm. But they, I mean, if you look at the drafts that they had in their, their winners' final round against Wind and Rain, they picked Tiny Wraith King in game number two. When's oh. the last time that a team? Had That is pretty crazy, actually. Uh, was that me? Okay, no. Are you Are you there, by the way? Uh, yeah, I am. Still okay, here. yeah, yeah. There was a little bit of a spike there. <laughs> so I, just, okay. I was like, dear God, did my net just seriously crash on me again? <laughs> <laughs> For those that tuned in last week, that did happen to me. But fingers crossed. I got a new modem and everything. It it did it did not blow up from what I know. This new one, at least, so we're good. Um, but no, yeah, like you're talking about with the draft right there. Yeah, let's do it. That, that's that's one of those. They tried something a little radical. Clearly, it didn't it's a work little out. Funky. <laughs> yeah, not not your everyday combo. But you know, I'm sure they gave but, respect to Winter Rain as well. Like they they figured maybe we we need to try something different because this is a very good team that we're going against. Did yeah, I, I mean, but that's that's kind of the point that I wanted to make is that this is a great team to have at Summit because they're not just playing meta picks. Like if you look at their, the BO5 for the actual grand finals to qualify, uh, let's do it. Played everything from Sven to Ursa mid to Broodmother, Pugna, Enchantress, Weaver, Centaur, you know, heroes that we don't see a lot of, and they had success with some of them. So, you know, that'll be nice uh, at an event where there's going to be six or five TI attenders plus this team. Yeah. Yeah, when it ran, I know a lot of people were also, you know, making the point, especially three of these players even being from the North American region, would have been really cool to see them at the event. But, you know, had to earn it. And in the end, uh, let's do it was the team 
uh, to take it. Alliance had a, had a fairly decent run themselves, you know, worthy note in my opinion. They, they ultimately lost to Let's Do It in the in the loser finals. They defeated the Spada uh, to get to that point. But uh, so they, they, this is a team that's still in the works, and uh, it'll be interesting, just like many of these teams, to see what kind of their roster looks like after the offseason. But personally, always been a fan of them and uh, seen more success. Now the final tribe, on the other hand, Boy, did they have a horrible finish to the season. <laughs> There's just no yeah. way around that. Both of the TIA qualifiers, one of the hottest teams in Europe going into it, then they just fell flat completely. And then here they go 0-2 in the group stages and get knocked out uh, without even advancing on themselves. So kind of you know the other side of the spectrum when you look at uh, teams and their finish of the season and what was kind of a last chance to at least uh, do something before potential roster shuffles and a whole new season, of course, begins. Yeah, I guys, mean, so. who knows? With with these teams, you never really know if any of these teams will be the same next mm -hmm. year just because of how that TI roster shuffle works every single year. Okay, so that leads us into the uh, the Summit 6 event now. Um, again, the team that won this, in this case, let's do it. They qualified. and Now, BTS was being very quiet, and you know, part of me believes that the main reason was because – they didn't even know <laughs> that they were kind of figuring it out on their side as far as how many teams they were going to have possibly, which teams would be willing to play. Because as as I've mentioned several times before, this Summit 9 event specifically, and we've had a couple in the past, lines up to where it's it's kind of like a, a warm-up event for TIA in a lot of ways. Um, and in this case, five of the six teams, other than Let's Do It, of course, all going to TIA. Those are the five invited teams as a result and uh, it's going to help them not only make a little bit of extra cash going into it, but they, you know, they're already going to be in North America for one now as a result of this, but helps them leeway into TIA itself with a good competition. So um, you, you see on your screen, by the way, I'm showing you got Evil Geniuses, VGJ Storm, Fnatic, Optic, and Pain Gaming. And then again, let's do it, the team that qualified. So, you know, right off the bat, you see very NA favorite, all three teams, in fact, for the TIA qualifiers. That qualified are, are playing in it. And then Pain Gaming from South America. And the Fnatic making their way from Southeast Asia. Um, I, I'm actually curious, uh, Elevator, for, for you. Well, what, were, what were your reactions when you when you saw these, these invites and uh, the teams that were going to be going to the Summit event? Um, I mean, it, it makes sense just because the NA invites at least make sense just because of how you know easy it is for them to get there. There's no real visa issues. Um these are all teams. Well, EG, EG is located in California, Optics, Texas, and yeah. BGJ Storm is New York, I believe, right? But I mean, none of that is hard travel, so it's very easy to, to plan and, and just get them there. Pain gaming, I mean, South America, it's obviously farther, but I feel like um, it's probably as good of a or as easy of a trip for them as any other team would have been. Uh, plus, I'm sure that the pain gaming guys are probably happy and potentially even boot camping, you know, in NA. That's my belief. I, if they're if you're like, attending this event, you're going to just simply boot camp in NA after the fact. Because why would you go well, in yeah. Fanatic's case? Why would you go all the way back to Southeast Asia and then come back, you know, a week later? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure that Fnatic and Pain will stay in NA. I'm not. I'm not sure if they were yeah. boot camping here already, but definitely. I mean, it makes sense. Pain obviously wants to have some better competition. They're going to DI. They're the only South American TI team. They probably want to practice um, against some better competition than they would be able to in in SA on SA Internet. So at least they'll be able to have you know, access to teams like EG and VGJ and Optic and whoever else is boot camping in the United States or Canada, which I think there are a number of other teams that are doing that. Yeah. Yeah, so obviously the teams themselves were, were one thing that uh, is always fun to talk about, but the other thing is the fact that there's only six teams, right? And so this, this, this I kind of go back to the point that I don't have any insider information, but I wouldn't be surprised if they obviously tried to invite teams like Liquid, you know, of course, Virtus Pro, the the two-time or even three-time returning champions as far as Summit goes, I want to say. So uh, they they no doubt invited Virtus Pro at the very least, especially with the drama that happened last time. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's it, obviously they, they, they I'm sure they turn it down because, again, whatever the reasons, they wanted to practice for home, they want a little bit more of a break, whatever. Um, so I, it, when, when I saw these infights, it did not surprise me whatsoever is the point I'm getting to. Um, the teams that they ended up choosing. And, you know, I started seeing comments about, like, oh, my God, three and eight teams, how bi is it? 
Guys, this isn't a DPC event first. This is not an official tournament. And th this is what always got underneath my skin as well before this whole DPC thing existed this year is when people would complain about invited teams to a lot of the, all these third-party events. And it's like, this is their tournament. They, they can literally invite whoever. They could have invited Team Leviathan, and as silly as that would have been, <laughs> It's their decision, and, you know, they're ultimately trying to, you know, sell tickets, you know, get the biggest viewership possible, trying to make their money back in a lot of ways. And, uh, yes, there's arguments that that means, you know, make sure you have the best teams too as well. But uh, in this case, they, they made sure they had the NA teams, the, the ease in a sense. And um, that ultimately meant now only six teams. Again, whether or not that was also intended because the previous summit they had nine teams. Uh, yep. that they actually played with. So, again, I go back to I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they were trying for, maybe even like a normal eight-team tournament. But they settled with six is what is what happens in the end. And now, again, I'm curious what kind of format they're going to go with because they also haven't now announced a format uh, that they're going to run with either. I'm assuming a round robin of sorts into just a four-team double elimination tournament maybe would make the most sense, but who knows? I mean, we'll see. It's going to be fun no matter what, I'm sure. Yeah, game. I would. It could be. I can't imagine that they would do any sort of groups. I think it's probably just going to be six team round robin, and then maybe like the top two seeds get a buy, and then everybody else goes into the bracket. Too, yeah. Something like that. Because I, I would. I would also imagine that all the teams will get to play in like the bracket after the supposed group stage, if that's how they run it. Mm -hmm. uh, just because it, would, it wouldn't really make sense to to eliminate two teams after the group stage. I don't think. Maybe. I mean, I don't really know what their time constraints <laughs> knows, are. Yeah. Um, so it's all speculation. Plus, I mean, they're also competing with bot TI, and obviously that's, you know, there's there's a whole lot of... <laughs> bot <laughs> I'm TI, kidding. yes. I'm, I'm kidding, we'll, of course. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second, too. But good old bot TI and the great event that has been as expected so far. Um, one other thing that we do know, though, of Summit, again, I'm sure we'll find out, probably next week at this point when the when is it by the way it starts the 25th so we still yeah. have a couple of weeks before it's supposed to take place uh so yeah we'll probably find out the format next week it really doesn't matter that much but uh look forward to that but yeah the talent list was announced earlier today and you know it's almost it's a lot of names as you would kind of expect in in, in a ways you know grand grand of course cna got himself is going to be there kyle's uh, making an appearance again bsj did a great job of the ti8 hub how about these names, though? Velot and a Havost. And they're going to be English talent, by the way. They're, they're not going to be yeah. Russian. They're, they're here to be English talent. Um, and obviously both speak English well enough to be able to understand, of course. But that's it, going to be it's kind of a fun changeup. I like it. I like seeing it. And obviously Velot especially. I mean, both these guys have been around the scene literally since the beginning, you know, plus more back in their original Dota days. So uh, it'll be fun to see them at the event. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th that's – the gist of the entire tournament. This yeah. is going to be a fun event. That's why the invites are the way they are. That's why the talent is the way it is. And I mean, just be thankful that there's more fun Dota to watch before TI. Otherwise it's, you know, a pretty big gap where we have to just kind of grind pubs or something, something like watch, that. Watch <laughs> a lot of pubs. I, I know Grant was right. talking about that. It's it, especially when uh, TI gets a little bit closer, even probably in the next couple of weeks here, uh, a lot of the teams will start coming over to NA and start their own boot camps even, and the NA pub scene gets ridiculous. Gets crazy, yeah. Like it's just it's crazy how uh, how good it's going to be. And Grant specifically naturally will be casting a lot of it, I'm sure nightly. So that 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 kind of is the 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 different Dota to watch. But in my opinion, it's it, it's a lot of fun too. So I, I am excited for that in itself. Uh, but yeah. yes, actual competitions. But this is it. It's always fun, <laughs> fun and a little unfortunate to see like the Chinese players' reactions or like the yeah. SEA players' reactions or the Euro players' reactions to NA pubs and like the toxicity and and they're like, what? How do you NA players have any skill at all? It's just like every game is ruined. <laughs> it's great. Um, no, so that that's uh that's still a little bit of time before to expect that. But again, TI itself is just over a month away now, officially at this point. Um. But yeah, that's another thing I just kind of realized too. I don't even think there's been like a prize pool announced for this either, for the summit event. So you know, yeah, they still have details to figure out here. <laughs> but either way, it's going to be some good Dota uh, to look forward to. So you hinted at Ti or Bot Ti, that is uh, Bot yeah. Ti, of course, continuing to happen, and we are down to our top sixteen. It looks like 
as a result of what we have, uh, how it's all been playing out. Now, I'm not going to lie. Unfortunately, I haven't been able to, uh, to keep up on a lot of it. I've been trying to watch a fair Missing amount, out, but man. I know. <laughs> I, if I, from some highlights and stuff I've been seeing, it's been uh, apparently pretty damn entertaining, as I expected. So, um, well, okay, I'll ask you that. It sounds like you've been watching a little bit. What, what, what has stood out to you? What's been fun to watch for you? Uh, I mean, what's really interesting is just that sometimes the bot behavior changes inexplicably. Like a, a group of bots that has been, <laughs> this is funny, the Dota Procast talking about Pro Dota and Bot DI in the same pro podcast. But uh, so some heroes will cast spells for like four rounds in a row, and then suddenly they'll get up against a certain hero, and then they just won't cast their spells. Brain fart, yeah. Yeah, and then they'll <laughs> lose. And so we've lost a number of really, really strong potential, you know, like semifinals, even grand finals heroes already, mm -hmm. just because they like didn't cast their spells uh, randomly. Um, and they have been running some of the simulations again, if that stuff sort of happens. But it apparently, in some cases, like the Juggernaut Centaur one, for example, um, everybody thought that Centaur was going to crush Juggernaut, and then all of a sudden, when they had all of his farm and like 6,000 HP, he just like sat there and just got Omni Slashed and did nothing. So <laughs> you just never know, man, with these bots. Yeah, it's like the thing uh, on paper. It's, yeah, of course it's going to go this way, but that's the wild card. You just don't know if they're, if they're going to actually even cast their abilities, let alone position themselves correctly. It's, and that, that, uh, there's no positioning or anything like that. It's just kind of like it's it's sort of an interesting insight into how the bots are coded as to like what the priority is as far as items and spells and that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah. So taking a look at our top sixteen, by the way, um, I've been I mean, kind of look at it now. There's one here that stands out that isn't here that I know both you and I were were talking about when we went into it was Spectre, where we thought that he was really going to be a powerful hero to look out for and go pretty deep, but I'm trying to find who we ended up losing to. Let's see if I can end up finding it. Spectre lost to Phoenix. Really? Yeah, Phoenix, is, Phoenix is strong. To one. It's, it's the ability to revive himself with full HP and mana. So two lives is better than one. I guess seems. Spectre's not the best at killing those. And that, that kind of makes sense. Yeah, they, they just all egg at the same time even, and what do you do? So. And the bots aren't going to run away, right? They probably just stand there attacking at that point. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we're definitely spoiling it for people in, in watching this live, unfortunately. But uh, I've been I've been mostly I've been watching as much as I can live, but then I've also just been going and watching the bots on the BTS. Oh, I didn't even know that. This is wait, this isn't even live. Hold on, what do, what do you mean? This isn't up to date yet? No, it is. I mean, just people that haven't oh. watched Bots yeah, yet. Are, are being spoiled that by what we're talking haven't about. been watching the vods or anything okay gotcha. yeah. yeah i mean yeah that's <laughs> we're here to talk about stuff that happens <laughs> i mean if, if you're tuning into our show you're going to be spoiled if you haven't watched vods of events that have been taking place that's just how it works um so yeah you look look at the final 16 for me that's that's going to be something that it, there's definitely heroes on here where you're like oh yeah that makes a lot of sense i mean a lot of it has to do with just big aoe burst right yeah. like aoe damage yep. that seems to be the ultimate theme with all of these heroes really yeah every single down. one of them has some massive damage aoe spell um you know you've got warlock has seemed like the strongest hero yeah. in the entire game just because of how strong the golems are and fatal bonds and that interaction but then you have zeus who has just been instantly deleting heroes like even heroes that have lots of magic resistance he's just been five ultimates plus five nemesis and static charge and everything. Zeus versus Warlock. That's, yep. That is going to be a good first round matchup there. I could definitely see that going either way. But th this is double elimination now. This is the first time in the event, I believe, where uh, yep. it's actually double elimination coming up as we hit top 16. So Yeah, so that's kind of cool because it, it does away with some of those weird matchups. And that was the thing is like some, some matchups, for example, like Anti-Mage, went out in like the first round because he happened to go up against Viper who completely owns him because of the, the passive break and yeah. the silence. And so he couldn't even do anything at all. Whereas anti-mage probably would have ripped through a bunch of other heroes, but you know, a lot of it is matchup based. And so that's, that is another kind of interesting thing about the bot TIs. You sort of get to see 
a little bit of like the interactions of how the spells work. And I've certainly been finding out various things about like what stuff stacks, like asses prey stacks. Who would have thought, you know, that's you never true. actually use that in a game, but there are some things that stack and some things that don't. Th that's a good point actually. Cause yeah, obviously you're never having the same hero in the first place. So you wouldn't even think about that stuff, but yeah, that makes sense. Um, all right. But uh, the, there's bot TI. Yeah, that's, We'll continue keeping an eye on that. I believe it's supposed to continue tomorrow. Yeah, this weekend uh, is is going to be the the finals, the whole main event. Sounds yeah. like there's going to be opening ceremonies and all sorts of nice, maybe even like bot profiles where you know they go to the bot's home country and oh God. interview their parents and stuff like I that. I just so love how good. how far they're taking this. It's so great. Oh, yeah. It's so Easy bots are just drawing in so much entertainment that I know I even brought. It, I was like fifty thousand plus viewers. I don't know how many it's actually been, but <laughs> we're getting to the point now as we start to get top sixteen that uh, that number could possibly be there. We'll see. We'll yep. see if we get there. But um, okay, so obviously we're going to be joined by Peter here in just about four or five minutes. Uh, that's the plan, at least uh, of Optic. So plenty to talk about with him. But uh, before we were, we wanted to get Optic Gaming's kind of preview out of the way, uh, at least uh, a little bit here, and then I'll, of course, talk with PPD about plenty of other things when it comes to Optic. But as mentioned at the beginning of the show, something that we're going to start doing now as we get closer and closer to TI8 is previewing teams that are going to be at TI8, previewing slash kind of recapping, I guess, uh, take a look at how their season went and uh, give us a good kind of remember, you know. Obviously, there's been a lot that's happened. It's been a very long season. And there's some things where you're like, oh, that's right, you know. This was a different roster five months ago. And now here they are. But So, Optic Gaming. Uh, first off, I mean, the idea of Optic joining Dota 2 was pretty cool. Like, th this is an organization that, especially in the North America region, they have a very successful Call of Duty team. Uh they never really, they've never been in a, a game like Dota before, but they figure, you know, we're going to pick up uh, this Dota squad and see how it goes. It's safe to say it's gone very well. The green wall has uh, made an impact, I think it's safe to say, in uh, Dota 2. Yeah, I mean, I was definitely really excited for an organization like Optic. When Optic and Immortals both picked up teams, I was really excited just because those orgs are really big in other games, and more exposure for Dota is always a great thing um, for the scene. And so, you know, I think Optic made a very smart business decision when they decided to put their chips in with somebody like PPD yes. and a team that he put together. And, you know, this team is not disappointed at all. I would say, I, I, I would say that for a team, you know, the, it's not just the org's first season. It's like these guys playing together is their first season. And so um, the way that they've, they've been quite consistent, you know, mm -hmm. They started out a little slow, but they've been pretty consistent um, in terms of hitting their stride and kind of improving every single tournament. And it's to me, it just kind of speaks to uh, the leadership of the team and the the development and the type of players that are on the team, as far as like that sort of growth towards uh, a really high standard. Which you know, a lot of the other teams in the Dota scene are kind of all over the place. Yeah, and you know in flux as far as whether they're going to be a good team or a terrible team at various tournaments. It just it feels very professional. I see what you're saying yeah. there. Um, before we continue to go on, real quickly, I uh, posted it in the chat, guys, something else that we want to do with the show here, too, is give you the chance to, you know, give your opinion, basically, voting on our polls that we're going to ha have here. Uh, in this case, we'll do it for each of the three teams that we're going to talk about today, but who do you guys think the MVP has been? Uh, for this season for, in this case, Optic Gaming. So I posted in the chat. There's also a Reddit post that I posted earlier, a little bit earlier today, uh, that not only you can find the links there for the polls that we have on today's show, but you can ask some questions. If you want to ask some questions to PPD, if you want to leave a question in the Reddit post, uh, we'll be referring that a little bit later on when we have PPD on, of course, and uh, possibly ask your question. Of course, we're, we're going <laughs> to take a look at it first and we'll just blindly ask questions. But if you have a question to ask, We'll do our best to take a look at that and ask. But uh, so yeah, Optic Gaming, obviously, uh, again talking about the organization right there. Remember they they picked up what was known as the Dire beforehand, uh, going to start the season. That's what they officially kind of signed up as, and it originally included Misery instead of three three. Uh, Misery, obviously, a very known player. And Soxa. And uh, oh yeah, that's right. It did include Soxa initially, didn't it? Um, yeah, it was Misery and Soxa, and Zai was the offlaner. That's right. Zai was in the position three, Misery, 
in that. Uh, wait, what? So wait, they had Soxa and Miz. Was Soxa a stand-in though? I think, yeah. Because I, I think Soxa. I don't think Soxa and Miz ever played on the same team this season, right? Were they ever mm -hmm. on the optic? I don't think they were. No. Okay, so yeah, because because even looking here at Liquipedia, it it does remind that. Um, yeah, the original squad was Misery on the four, PVD on the five, yeah. Zion on the three, and then Soxa came in. After Soxa Misery were, after left. Misery left, yeah, to go to EG. Soxa was kind of the original replacement, I guess, and then uh, that's where three three eventually joined the squad. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's how it played out. Yeah, you see, Soxa played at a couple of events throughout the season when it came down to participating with the team, but. Yeah, I mean, so the so the start was clearly a little bit rocky for Optic Gaming, and uh, you, you know, looking at their success even earlier on in, in the season, right here, uh, take back all the way to 2017, of course, uh, where it began in September. There, um, you know, they, they were having they they actually qualified for a couple of events, including Galaxy Battles, which, uh, well, we we all know what happened to that <laughs> one, and yeah, that essentially yeah. didn't happen though. Uh, unfortunately. But their first land didn't come until ESO1 Katavichi, where they had a disappointing 9th through 12th place finish, though, as you see right here. It wasn't until, you know, later on in the season where they well, actually... They were, they were at the Summit. They were at Summit 8. Oh, they were at Summit 8. That's right. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually just looking at the majors yeah. there. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, down here. There you go. Um, they finished 6-7th there. Then the Rock Masses, which wasn't an official tournament, but uh, they did get they got runner up to Empire. That's right, that best of five there that they ended up playing throughout the season. But the, I think the point is that you can kind of see this team improve throughout the season uh, in a lot of ways. And by by the time the end of the season came around, it's like all of a sudden they're competing for a top eight spot for a TI eight, which we would not have expected, you know, with with two months remaining into the season. But uh, obviously, they're they're a crazy good finish at second place at the ESL one Birmingham event is what allowed them to put themselves in contention in the end. So. Yeah, I mean, this is a team that was, you know, they were playing all the NA qualifiers and they were winning, I would say, maybe like a third or maybe half of them earlier on. And then they went from kind of being a questionable, making it through the qualifiers to basically being like a guaranteed to make it to all of the tournaments in the NA qualifiers. Mm -hmm. And then obviously those, you know, final few events, they looked like the best team in NA um, by a pretty large margin, at least uh, until BGJ Storm kind of uh, finalized their roster and started competing against them. Yeah. And, you know, bias or not from, from my side, I mean, I, I definitely had complexity earlier on as far as, more expected out of them earlier on in the season, and we and we kind of got that in a lot of ways. But then eventually, you know, complexity had a little bit of their drama. VGJ Storm, which we'll talk about later on, of course, didn't really become a bigger threat until the massive roster changes and later on in the season themselves. So, um, all right, it looks like PPD is ready though. So, cool. since we're talking about Optic, I, I guess we might as well <laughs> look to bring him on. So the call might hang up here as I add it. So just give give me a second to set it up real quickly. As I do this. Uh, no, that's not what I want. Oh, yes. There we go. All right. Uh, let me turn mine off. Hello. Hello. PPD, right. you can hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Awesome. I can hear you as well. Let me turn you up a little bit on my end. There we go. Great. Welcome to the show, man. Happy to, happy to have you on. Yeah, how's it going? It's going pretty good. We're talking about uh, we're talking about you guys, as far as optic in the season. Good things, of course. <laughs> Nothing but good things. So, um, <laughs> we uh, want to have you on the show. Well, first of all, we're happy to have you on the show, as we talked about. But we also wanted to have you on because uh, not only to talk about optic, but uh, wanted to also talk about this NADCL. So, do, do we want to start with that first? You want to want to talk about that first? Whatever you guys, whatever you know, what. Whatever you guys are doing, if you guys are talking about Optic, we can talk about Optic first, and then that after, it doesn't matter to me. Okay, so I, I think then if, if that's – we'll start with Optic because, yeah, well, nice transition right there. Uh, so we're kind of – we're, we're going through the season, how obviously, you know, the the star, it was, a, it was a different roster than what you guys finished with. But uh, with Optic Gaming in general, what, what, were, what were your expectations with Optic when, it, when you put it together – um, and I know ultimately you know, to win everything in the end, but what were your realistic expectations, and do you think they kind of played out as you expected in the end? 
Uh, I didn't really, I don't think I had very like strong expectations for the new team. I like, I kind of went to TI and at TI seven, I kind of decided officially that I wanted to play. And I just started like building a team with people that were there. And I ended up getting like super lucky that Zai was just like conveniently like leaving EG or I'm not, I'm, like not a hundred percent certain what happened there, but all of a sudden Zai wanted to play with me and then. Once I had Zai, it was so much easier to go out and get like other premier players. Um, I mean, I, I kind of lucked out and I ended up building like a pretty awesome squad that I, that, you know, that had the potential to win early, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it took a little bit to get going, but I mean, we gradually just got better and better. And I don't think we had any like huge setbacks, a couple of tough losses here and there. Um, but, you know, with some better bracket luck, we could even, even had a better year, I think. So, Obviously, again, goes back to the roster being a little bit different in the beginning of the season. Were there obvious problems there for you with uh, with misery on on the team, or was it just simply it, it just it was kind of a mutual agreement that it'd just be better off in both cases, or what was the deal there? Uh, yeah, it wasn't really a like it wasn't really my decision at all. Like misery just kind of left, um, and he wasn't like asked to leave, and there wasn't like there really wasn't like any bad blood or anything. I think that we were just kind of um, the way we were set up as a team at that moment wasn't particularly great, mostly because we had these two European players, or I guess Zai as well, so Misery, Pycat, and Zai were all flying over to the U.S. to, like, boot camp and play in qualifiers. And we weren't, like, set up in, like, people weren't, like, living in Dallas or anything. So we just, like, you know, we all went to a land cafe every day and then stayed at a hotel and... And then we just lost, right? We lost these qualifiers. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first round of qualifiers, we won the very first one to qual. We won the Kings Cup to qualify to the Summit, and then, you know, we got like second in the other three qualifiers, which you know, second gets you nowhere. So, um, you know, from these like, I think Misery went on these like back to back like fourteen hour over the Atlantic Ocean flights after like losing qualifiers for these like two week long boot camps, and I think that that was kind of like he was like, oh, like you know, maybe this isn't the best thing for me right now. Yeah. So. It wasn't like it wasn't I mean it was fine it was fine I was like uh, pretty disappointed that he was leaving but um that's just how it goes and people have to make the best decisions for themselves so then the... I was actually okay go ahead sorry uh, I was wondering when you were in the process of forming your team did you have like a, a sponsor in mind because I think at that point you were still like with or, or part owner of EG or something like that and people were speculating whether you'd be like a secondary EG team um, oh, um, yeah, no, it's, I mean, there's, I don't really think that there's a lot to gain for teams to have a second Dota team right now, especially if they're expecting to pay like the premium salary numbers. Uh, I don't think like any esports team could really afford that for the most part, not that anybody's making money, but, um, I mean, I knew, I, I know a lot of the other like team owners and stuff in the US, right? Just because of like where I've been and what I've done. So um I don't know. Like I guess they kinda like me. So it was like easier to go like and talk to Optic and then also the the investors that backed Optic were the ones that I was talking to with EG or I had spoken to quite a bit uh when I was with EG. So I was very familiar with that entire group. So it was like a very easy uh transition since I already knew everybody. Cool. Kind of on the on the note a little bit, of course, with your background of last season, you were on a break, we'll say. I mean, but you clearly did want to play. You made that point several times. You even attempted to make a team last season, the season before, and you know, kind of fell through. But did that break maybe help you in some ways, or what? Do you really not think much of it? Like being on the business side of that, give you you know help you or or no? Uh, I think it definitely helped me on like the business side of my intelligence or like my business knowledge, right? Like having that year to like actually run a company. I, I think I learned a lot on like my business interests in life for sure. Um, did I, I don't think it really helped me become a better Dota player. I think it made me a worse Dota player because I didn't play Dota for, yeah. you know, hardly a year. Um, I played a couple times a month and then I played quite a bit in the first couple of months with uh, team wanted that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, I played a pretty, I played an all right amount, but I wasn't playing like full time, full time the way you need to be as like a premium player. So when you take a year off like that, it definitely sets you back quite a bit, I think. 
So when we talked about the, going back to the misery situation again, the the, the biggest the last roster change that I guess essentially happened was three three, uh, joining you guys. And now this is a player that we 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 heard. I mean, we knew of him, but he wasn't like the star name player necessarily at the time. And you know, you think organizations like Optic Gaming, you know, yourself PPD with much success, Zion, everything picking up three uh, three. It was that. Uh, was that the plan all along, or you know, what, did, did it kind of just work that way, or were you always going after him, and was he, you know, kind of expected a good player? So we were considering a couple different players. We were between Universe, right, who had just been kicked from EG, so he was a free agent. So obviously, you know, obviously we have to consider it, right? And then we were thinking about uh, SVG, who had yet to like officially team up with VCJ Storm, I think, at that time, uh, and he had just left EG as a coach. Right. Yeah. And then um, I think like the European guys, especially I think Zai was mentioning three three, and I you know personally I never really played in like any of these European qualifiers. I never you know I don't play European matchmaking very often, so I never I didn't I didn't really know him right, and I didn't like pay much attention to like his previous year because I wasn't playing Dota professionally that year. So like the Hellraisers team was like uh, very under the radar mm -hmm. for me, right? Uh, I don't even know if I because I, I I wasn't even like casting the group stage, so I don't even know if I like I maybe caught a couple of games of like Hellraisers getting stomped by somebody else. Um, so I actually didn't even know anything about him, but everyone was just saying that like he was insanely talented and that you know it's hard to go wrong with a guy like this because he just you know he plays every hero, he plays every lane, he plays every role, um, and he's just like super good at it. And I was just like, to me, he just sounded like another Zai, right? Like yeah. that's why I love playing with Zai so much because he can play any hero, and if it turns out to be like some game where like one of our supports needs to like transition to like some farm heavy carry and like carry the game, like Zai will do it right on that like that four Wind Ranger or four Zeus or something, right? All of a sudden he's top net worth and just winning the game. Like Zai, Zai will do that, and Neta can do that as well from any position. And you know we've seen him this year play, you know one, two, three, and four. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, but he's a greedy player. Yeah, I don't think he could play five. <laughs> There's very few people who can play five and yes. really play the five. So. Uh, uh, okay, go ahead. I, I was gonna ask if, uh, like, if scouting new talent, for example, like, do you go back and, and watch, like, when you were considering thirty three, would you go back and, and watch his pro matches and kind of just like see how he approached the game, or what, like, what's the process for scouting new talent? Would you say? Oh, man, I don't know. I think that leaderboards is really a safe play for sure. Um, just like identifying strong players that are high ranked on the leaderboards and then going in and watching them further. Um, I think like, Top Sun's a great example. Also, Top Sun was streaming, right? I think that helped him a lot uh, to join OG because whenever any of those players on OG was like thinking, they're like, oh, man, who should we pick up? Like our team just got gutted. Like who do we need? Oh, man, we need this like star mid player. Oh, who do we have? Like, yeah, that Thompson guy is pretty good. Okay, I can just go watch his stream and watch him play, you know, watch his player perspective for four or five games. And then you can, like, you can so easily identify if this guy is, like, good enough to play at a professional level or not. Yeah. Because you have access to, you know, he's, a, he's giving himself that exposure, right? Right. So I think that was pretty big. And um, in terms of recruitment, I don't think there is, like, a lot of great places other than just like these um you know you have like these open qualifier teams right that with the with the high rank matchmaking players who have made teams for themselves and then occasionally they squeak through into like the early rounds of the minor and major qualifiers but usually they don't make it much further than that so you don't really get to see them in proper settings makes sense so one one more player I I I want to I want to bring up is is CCNC of course a younger player on the team and this is a player his history is when it comes to competitive Dota didn't have the most experience but of course uh, was a known streamer and top tier player kind of going to your point that you're just talking about Peter that obviously you've decided to team up with him and how how is how is do you think he's uh, transitioning into being a pro player is he is he fitting is he working like like you'd expect and you wanted him to be or still more you expect out of him or what. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, I would love for him to win more lanes, as as I would everybody, right? I mean, that's that's generally what you just wish for. Uh, I think that he's done a really awesome job. I think that he's been a really solid mid player overall throughout the year. Um, you know, of course, it's nice when you have you know some maybe some like no one on your team who just wins like you know lanes he's supposed to lose, 
right? Like that yeah. that helps you helps you get by drafts quite a bit. Um, but I mean, he's carried us in a ton of games, and you know we've carried him in some games, and that's just that. I guess that's just how it goes. I don't. I mean, he's a really good teammate. He is always like super positive, and I don't think anybody works harder than he does. He's just like always watching replays, always doing one v ones, always going over other people's replays with them, like his other friends on other teams. Like, I mean, he definitely works probably the hardest on our team. So it's safe to say he lives up to his name playing in the team. I mean, he's, he's Dota obsessed, right? Yeah. He's what, like 19 years old. And I remember when I was 19, I only thought about video games. Yeah. Right. So he's like in that wake up, think about Dota, play Dota, dream like, like go to sleep and dream about dota like that's that's actually his life yeah so that's your that's your optimal dota player for sure <laughs> yeah he's um he's got plenty of love i was also gonna say the thing about three three is like we didn't really um like he had never played four before right so we weren't like sure like but we just knew that he was like an incredibly talented like player right like his uh his most played heroes are like earth spirit and meepo which says like he has incredible mechanical skill right so I think it's I think a lot of teams are leaning towards that process of recruitment of just like picking up these like insanely good players and then just like eventually having them settle into some role that works for them or for the team. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So and when you're looking at a player, like how would you rate like if you were to bring in a player, a new player to the team, what would you sort of rate as like the most important as far as like communication, mechanical skill, like size of hero pool, oh. that sort of those attributes? So, <laughs> I mean, lucky, lucky for me, I chose the five position because, I mean, obviously <laughs> my mechanical skill is way worse. I mean, it's, it's quite a bit different, you know, maybe more unique than the rest of my teammates. Um, but, like, I think mechanical skill is very, very important. And then you also, like, need to be... I mean, you need to want to be, you need to have like that hunger to be like, want right. to be the best. And you need to also have this like arrogance slash confidence that you are and can be the best. Yeah. You can't like, I Quint, Quint's talked about it a bit in some interviews he's done. Uh, he, he's talked about like facing off against mid, like mids, like no one is like, you can't really think about the player that you're playing against. You just need to assume that like, you know, you're going to do everything that you can to beat him and try to eliminate like other external factors that might trip you up. Yeah. And I think that's where that, that younger aspect definitely comes into play as well. It helps when I mean, you think of a lot of these mid players specifically. A lot of them happen to be somewhat younger. So, um, Looking yeah. back more at the season specifically now, going away from the roster itself, but uh, obviously it was a long season, and I, I got to ask off the bat on that note, what was it like? You've been through many seasons and different games even. Uh, what was it like to do with this grind of a season? Because uh, a lot of tournaments, a lot of travel even more in the later part for you guys, but uh, d did you overall appreciate the season or was it too much or what? Um, I think it was, it was definitely my busiest year, uh, but it kind of felt like we didn't, I mean, it was definitely my busiest year, I think. And it didn't really seem like we were like super, super busy until the end of the year, because that's when we started like qualifying to all the tournaments and traveling to all of the things. And then we just did these like two back to back, like five week trips on the road. Um, so I feel like I haven't been home at all in like a couple, like six months pretty yeah. much. And then before that, like even then, like we were still doing boot camps for, uh, qualifiers, right? So I was still leaving home and traveling to Texas or wherever we were set up. Um, so, I mean, not, not my favorite year for sure, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's fine. You know, I'm optimistic and looking forward to next year. Yeah. Just as I was, you know, years in the past. I, th I think Did you kind of miss having, not having a coach at all. Like, cause you're one of the only teams that doesn't have a coach, right? Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> coaches, it's just difficult to do. And I think that unless you really think that somebody's going to bring a ton of value to the table, I think there's way too much money on the line to just kind of give a handout to somebody who's your buddy. Right. So if somebody actually thinks that they can help and I actually believe that they can help and everyone on my team believes that they can help, then we will we'll get a coach. Makes sense. All right. So hit up Peter if you're interested in being a coach. 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> all right. So, again, the season had a very interesting finish for you guys. All of a sudden, you're on the verge of possibly even qualifying for TIA. Uh, you know, kind of this uh, out of nowhere going to the super major. What I, I got to figure morale is pretty high, you know, after your ESL1 success. Is that something that – you kind of expected, or were you at that point almost just focusing like, all right, TIA qualifiers are coming up, let's just worry about that, or all of a sudden yeah, you have a chance? Oh, I mean, you're talking about the ESL and then the Super Major? Well, yeah, the, the fact that you guys were in contention out of nowhere, it felt like, for a TIA. Yeah, I was, uh, it was pretty unfortunate that VP gave up Wisp twice to LGD, and we had to play VP in the lower bracket once again. <laughs> um, but, I mean, it's hard to say that we were a top-four team at either of those tournaments. And I, I mean, if you're only going to reward points to the top four teams at DPC events, then we probably don't deserve any DPC points because we're not a top four team, nor were we at any of these events. So uh, we almost got like lucky and like squeaked through barely a yeah. couple times, right? And I, I mean, I definitely think that we're better than some of the other teams that actually did get invited. Um, but that was just how the system was set up. So I think mm -hmm. that it worked how it was supposed to. Yeah, yeah I, I know you, you've been pretty vocal about that. That's something that, you know, one of the many things that you kind of look back at with the season and specifically as you're talking about there with the top four only getting points. I, I That is one of the bigger ones, which you kind of hope that will be a change uh, moving forward here into the next season. But um, we'll see, obviously. Uh, so the season ended. You guys are then playing the qualifiers. The announcement came out, you know, three NA teams. I not even worth asking, I'm sure, but yeah, I'm sure you were hyped about that in itself. No one knows that increased your chances quite a bit right off the bat. Yeah, um, I mean, it's definitely nice. Um, you know, I heard some rumblings and bumblings that, you know, that might have been a possibility. So I was pretty excited to hear the confirmation. It was actually pretty funny. We were all at the um, the super major after party, right? Okay. And uh, it was basically just in like the hotel bar and we're all just like sitting around and it was kind of a lame party. So everyone was just like chilling and like, you know, drinking and like snacking and whatever and just talking. And then not only the patch notes came out, but also the uh, the qualifier spots came out. And so then it was just like all the NA teams were like walking around, like doing like cheers and like <laughs> cheers and glasses and uh, all the European like players and stuff were yeah. like mad. It was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I would imagine the difference right there. Yeah, the CIS, the European region players, they probably weren't too happy. Yeah, that was happened, a good time. But, um, now, of course, you still had to ultimately qualify. You got close initially as BGJ Storm ended up uh, getting that first place seed, though. You had to play those tiebreakers. Then you enter the playoffs. Then you guys lose to Immortals, and all of a sudden you're finding yourself in the losers bracket. Uh, I'm, I'm, and I'm sure it's kind of an obvious question, but – did you have trouble like calming down your team in a sense? Was a team very nervous at that point or were you know, with your experience, you know, kicking in or what? Oh yeah. I'm getting a lot of credit these days. Um, uh, I don't think it was my experience. I think that going into the qualifiers, I think that we felt like we were a top six team in the world after the super major and ESL and whatever tournaments we were playing towards the end of the year. Um, so I think that we were kind of expecting to be a TI or we had the kind of confidence that we would be a TI, um, fell a little short and had to go to, had to go over to Toronto for two weeks for a qualifier. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, um, we weren't losing to immortals was pretty soul crushing, I think, because we felt like we had beat them, uh, losing in the group stages to VGJ though, wasn't. Um, very disheartening because, like, first off, we just haven't played good in online qualifiers throughout the entire year. And uh, they kind of, like, set the meta and, like, defined it for everybody. So I don't know what really happened on that day against Immortals. I think that we were just behind the meta on everybody in terms of drafting and strategy. And once we kind of caught up and figured it out, I think that we had a lot better chance. But uh, even against, like, the complexity games, which I'm sure you were watching Breaky, I mean, we probably should have lost three out of the four of those games we played against those guys. Um, so I imagine those loss those losses were pretty tough on them. Yeah. Well, close games. I definitely was watching, but you, yeah, you, got, you guys got... deserve to win, though, in the end, I think. So. No, for sure. I mean, <laughs> of course we deserve to win, right? Like, they obviously did not deserve to win. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm glad we got to go because I do feel like we were one of the best three teams in North America this year. And I think that we're one of the best 18 teams in the world this year. 
and I'm excited to prove it in Vancouver or hopefully, you know, get a good placing. Yeah. So you're going to TIA, of course. And again, that must be pretty good. You, you were a player the several previous years and yeah, the break last season. So um, it's, uh, it's got to be a good feeling there now. And one last kind of question before we move on to other things here from me, at least is how does this team compare to uh, your previous EG squad, specifically the uh, TI5 team, of course. Um, is there any comparisons there that you could think of? Or? The TI5 team was a lot luckier, I think. Okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know. We, <laughs> we caught so many breaks. I mean, I feel like my entire Dota career has been summed up by, like, mm, like I ended up just, like, playing against Chinese teams in all the big tournaments, and then... I just getting like good bracket luck at all of the internationals for the most part. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'll take it. Right. Uh, that year, I mean, we weren't really the best team at the tournament. We ended up just, I mean, secret bombed out and we were just played a bunch of Chinese teams and won, which was great. Um, and then this year with this team, it's, uh, it's a lot harder to win because everybody else is so much better than they were before. Yeah. And, that's back then the, the EG team relied on like skill a lot, especially with like Sumail, right? Like we just relied on him just outplaying everybody, which he like manhandled other like professional mid players. Um, and now that doesn't really happen for, I mean, just about anybody, maybe, maybe except no one, right? From VP. But um, I don't know. It's just different. I mean, I'm a lot different, right? Like I've, I don't have any expectations of winning. I just like want to do our best. And I think that our best is good enough to win a lot of games. Yeah. Is there a part of you that wants to play slash defeat evil geniuses at TI or do you just not really care? Are you past that at this point? <laughs> I've been past that for quite a bit. Um, I mean, we played them at like the what the super major i think so yeah. right and uh i mean we were fine to play them because we just felt like we were a better team at that time so if that's the case at ti and like you know we drop to like some lower bracket and we see them there and we feel like we're the better team at the time then we'll be happy to like we'll be like confident and happy to play them yeah and you know, obviously you're always happy to win it doesn't matter who it is all right. Well, I think that covers that for Optic here. And again, best of luck, of course, at uh, TIA coming up. So a little bit. Of time. You guys going to be obviously you got something we were just talking about. Summit Nine coming. You excited for that? I'm sure. What's coming? The Summit Nine event that you're going to be attending. Oh yeah, yeah. The Summit Nine. Hopefully. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of fun this year. I, there's only like six teams, I think, or something. So yeah. I'm sure. I was talking to Grant about it. He says that it's going to be the best summit yet. So, <laughs> well, uh, we'll wait and see. All right, it, sh it should be a fun event there. All right, <laughs> so something uh, kind of this kind of takes back to what we were discussing earlier. In fact, the idea of how do you get more exposure, you know, in the competitive scene? How does this work as far as uh, or what opportunities are out there? And I think it, this is one of the inspirations, at least, for what you announced fairly recently, uh, and that being the NADCL that uh, you announced. I want to say even earlier this week, if I'm not mistaken, or this last weekend at this point but uh i'll let you kind of give a input on what so what what is the nadcl exactly oh wow okay so well it's right now it's not really much of anything right it's just an idea and a dream but uh, <laughs> no i mean the idea is just to create a semi-professional scene which is just totally non-existent in dota um even professional teams this year were like struggling to get by players that have salaries right which is like you have your salary to play this game each and every day but the fact that only one or two teams out of your region gets to go to any tournaments to make any money and to get any exposure, it's not really like a viable business model for teams and players. So if that's not going to change, then I felt like introducing something like this was totally necessary in order to like keep um, new players like wanting to become professionals, which I think is important for a game. I also think that like I think that any time that people are making more teams for an esport or like a professional sport i think that's a positive sign for the game um and that just wasn't happening in na there's like there's like four or five teams that are consistent throughout the year and then every other thing is just some open qualifier stack that would play in the major and minor qualifiers which were you know sometimes three to four qualifiers in like a five-day period and then after that five-day period there would be absolutely nothing for four weeks mm -hmm. so 
nobody practiced during those off days, right? Nobody was like sticking together. And realistically, you know, by the time 30 days had passed, it'd be like, you know, maybe you got a new job or maybe you're, you know, you, your class has started or, you know, whatever it might be like you're, you have distractions and you can't play with like the same five guys. So the idea behind this is to create a league for the teams that are not attending like valve DPC events and that don't get paid every day. Don't have the opportunity just to sit there and practice all day that have other external things going on in their lives that stop them from committing full time. This is like meant to give back to them or to give them a place to actually have a chance at progressing in their Dota careers. Uh, Cause there's, there's so many of these guys who sit between like ranks, mm, let's say like ranks 50 to 1000, right? Like if you're a top 1000 Dota player, you probably play a lot of Dota, right? Yeah. Like I, I, I can't, I, I, would, myself, I, so I don't know. I, yeah. I wouldn't even know how many games a week you'd have to play to like keep like to get there. But like at some point in your life, like, you played a lot of Dota, right? Um, and you're just not like there's no compensation for that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely none. So yeah. it's like uh, you're a badge in game, man. It's pretty. Cool. Yeah, you're either like rich or you starve. <laughs> I don't know. There's a better like word for that, right? There's a saying. I forget. I'm what. sure there is. Yes, I can't think of it now. Top of my head. Feast or famine, right? There you yeah. go. There we go. Got it. So yeah, I'm doing that. It's gonna start in like October. Um, okay. I announced pretty early and like, it's like not really concrete, nothing really. Cause it's still kind of all up in the air, but I wanted to announce early and just like, listen to all of the feedback and like, kind of like see who was interested and see who maybe who wanted to help or who wanted to, you know, maybe sponsor it or something like that. And we're just going to give it a lot of time to figure out exactly what the product needs to be. And then hopefully with the support of you know, all of the North American players that want to play will be able to build something really cool and then continually build upon that um, in seasons to come. So this awesome, isn't man. this isn't me meant meant to be taken the wrong way by any means, but because obviously I think the idea of this is great. But you're you're a very successful player yourself. You, you you're yet again going going to TI, right? You, you know why why are you doing this, right? Like why why are you taking some of your time to put on this <laughs> league? Uh, well. I don't know. I mean, is somebody else going to do it? <laughs> well, so it's that's that, that simply it then. It's just you care that much about the about the scene. It sounds like, yeah. Well, I've like I'm. I don't know if you can notice this, Breaky, but I feel like I'm a pretty ambitious person. <laughs> so I like to do. I'm much more than just a Dota player. Um, I think, or at least I aspire to be. Mm -hmm. And that's like you know you see me like become like CEO of EG. Like that didn't just like happen, right? Like that that wasn't just a coincidence, right? Like I wanted it and I made it happen. And I also got like incredibly lucky and it was like really crazy, but uh, it still happened. And I, um, I think that I don't know how much I could do to like build my own brand in the Dota space. Uh, I don't really feel like I could be like some big streamer or, you know, something along those lines. So I felt like some other form of like business model was appropriate. And I feel like that, not only is this like, I don't know if it's the best business that idea, but it just seems like a really good idea just for Dota in general. Um, so I just, I don't know. I'm just going to do, I'm just doing something. And um, when I started to like think about this idea, I just had a couple of like conversations with people. And then I it started like one conversation to the next and eventually it just like kind of just happened. So yeah. I'm just like slowly progressing with it and just trying to make it as cool as possible. Yeah, I definitely think there's a void in the space. I mean, I previously worked for companies like like Game Leap and Pugna, and it was the, sort of the same motivation as wanting to give like the the up and coming the the guys who are trying to make it in the scene some form of compensation for all of their you know it is work. Like if you become a really good Dota player, you are putting in work. It's not just playing the game, um, and so there certainly is that void to be filled. And um, so, I mean, uh, hats off to you for just going for it and, and trying to make something like this happen because, um, you know, I come from like a traditional sports background as well. And all the traditional sports have a very sort of defined path to getting yeah, to the professional right. scene yeah. through college and drafts and, you know, minor league teams and that sort of stuff. And so uh, any sort of development like that in the esports space, I think is a really good thing. So I, I am pulling for you 
and the well, NADCL. I make appreciate it. it. Thank you. <laughs> is there any inspiration from from China on this? Obviously, they're they're seen as far as outside of the tier one is pretty successful because of stuff like this. Is I assume you've looked over there and gotten some inspiration. Yeah, I mean, I look at like the DPC for example. Like that's the best example. It's a uh, just you know a giant league of you know not necessarily your premier Chinese teams just like facing off against each other just yeah. regularly throughout the year. Uh, it gives them you know some ideal place to like practice and compete, and it gives them a reason to scrim and it gives them a reason to practice. So I just feel like that there's just I feel like there's just no motivation in these other regions without like these semi-professional leagues being set up. There's just, there's nothing to gain. I don't think you can go from like this player without a team and without a sponsor. And then all of a sudden you can expect to find four people like-minded and then, you know, get them together for six months of practice with, you know, getting paid $0 and attending zero events. And then eventually like slowly squeaking your way into tournaments. Like mm -hmm. that's so hard to do. So like there needs to be, you know, some some path. There needs to be some place or some something's got to you know help you out along the way, and that's what this is essentially going to try to be. Yeah, no, it's 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 obviously a really cool idea. You mentioned it's going to be starting in October. Uh, so still a little bit of time here, of course, TI in between and everything. But if people are looking to support it or get involved or even help, I don't know if you guys are looking for help right now or anything like that. But uh, where could they go if so? Well, right now we're just kind of like sitting on everything. We're just waiting and seeing what kind of feedback and interest we get from people and really just trying to, I guess, just think about exactly what we want to make it uh, okay. before making anything too official. Um, uh, we, I guess there's a Twitter and there's a Twitter and a Twitch page right now. And we're, you know, we're working on setting up like an official tournament page where people will have access to potentially some crowdfunding opportunities. And I want to do a couple maybe a couple pre-shows. I'm also going to work on publishing some, maybe some content, you know, maybe some player interviews or player quotes or just, you know, something hearing back from maybe other professional players about how important the semi-professional scene is and, you know, what they're looking forward to about it. So uh, just check out the Twitter, I guess, right? NADCL League, I believe. I, I, and, I uh, link yeah. the Discord in chat as well because there is that. Too. Okay, yeah, yeah. The Discord is great if if you're actually interested in like following the league or even participating in the open qualifiers. That'll start in October. If you head to the Discord, it'll give you instructions for anything. Also, uh, if, I don't know if you got any casters in here. I'm sure you got some, you know, some breaky CPK fanboy casters in the chat um, that are you know aspiring wannabe casters themselves. There's a is it like an, uh, if you go to the casters channel on the discord, you'll be able to like find some information about how you could sign up and how you can maybe start, you know, start casting some games. It's, so. it's an opportunity for more than just players. Yeah, well, that's great. Of course. That's, that's what this all is, right? <laughs> Esports becoming a more legitimate business. It gives opportunities to all sorts of different people. Absolutely. That's uh that's exciting. It's a little bit of time here, but so check out the discord, uh, Twitter, as you mentioned right there as well. If you'd like to uh, either be involved or, you know, support or a anything along those lines. So, um, I did want to ask, um, it, from what I've seen as far as like the Twitter and, and Discord interaction stuff, it looks like your brother and your are your dad also involved in it. Yep, those are the oh, yeah. two. Are definitely my dad, and then my brother is helping out. He's trying to help out with the content side of things, and then everybody's just kind of like head adminning um, as we get started. So it's been uh, it's been a cool opportunity for me to really reconnect with my family, I guess you could say. So it's been uh, it's been a fun ride so far. Nice. Uh, if you don't mind, just uh, there's a couple of Reddit questions. Uh, we've answered actually most of them already, but uh, just a couple that I have right here that I, I think were kind of interesting uh, just sure. overall. Uh, do you have any hunches as far as what the TI meta will be by chance uh, coming up? It's still a month away, you know, and things can change. But do, do you have any hunches? Have you been noticing some other teams' uh, strategies or what? Well, we haven't really seen any of the teams at the international play. I think that the Summit will be a nice precursor for potentially some flavor heroes. Uh, that might be popular at TI, but I mean, the whole TI meta is going to be totally different than what it was before. And I really won't know what it's going to be until I start scrimming other teams um, once we get to Vancouver or even during our boot camp in Texas. Okay. All right. Well, uh, that's actually, I think that's it because everything else we have actually answered right there. 
Well, that's Deputy. fantastic. Always, uh, always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to talk with you, and uh, thanks for talking with us But Optic. And, of course, this uh, NADCL, really excited for it. Uh, it's a little bit of ways again, but uh, can't wait for it. But any shout-outs from yourself? Anything else? Uh, no, I mean, let's see. No shout-outs. Um, when's Batiai starting? Is that soon? <laughs> Batiai is tomorrow, <laughs> damn it. Yeah, who do you have winning it all in Batia? That's, <laughs> that's the meme, right? Yeah, who do you who, who do you have it winning all Batia? There, it's we got our top sixteen. I feel like I feel like I saw Tide. I feel like Tide looked pretty good, yeah. or maybe it was. Um, I didn't watch all of them, but I saw somebody was like doing some actual some moves. I forget who it was. Somebody had some skills. Some fun matchups, man. Know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it was pretty entertaining. We, I watched a bit of it at our uh, at the boot camp for the TI qualifiers. Like after all the games and stuff, when I was just like, you know, dead from playing Dota for fourteen hours, and just like chill out and watch the bot TI. It's pretty funny. <laughs> Naturally, watch more TI. That's just uh, or mo watch more Dota. I mean, watch more Dota. Watch Absolutely, more Dota. fake Dota, but you know, whatever. It's entertaining. Um, I'm probably gonna I'm probably gonna stream later tonight. If anybody wants to check out my channel, I'm gonna be you know. Crushing some NA pubs as I always do. Always fun to Playing watch. Some Trant, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if Trant's not banned, it's like it's it's auto banned every game now. So yeah. we'll see. Jeez. 50 50. <laughs> and then it's 50, <laughs> it's it's 50 50 if it gets banned, and then it's you know 50 50 if it's you know if I have my team as first pick or not. So it's only 25% chance I get to play Trant in games. <laughs> All right, PPD, always a pleasure again, and I want to thank you one more time for, for joining us here on the show, and best of luck, obviously, with TI8 coming up here. It's, it's going to be fun. You guys are going to be boot camping, I assume? Uh, you know, I think we're just going to take it easy this just year. I don't easy. really think it, I, How much is the prize pool again? <laughs> it, uh, just 20, 20 it just barely reached over $20 million. Yeah, it's, it's not how much is much. How much is first? I don't know. Do you know? A couple million at least. Couple, Probably couple a little million? bit more. It's probably like eight, <laughs> something like that. It's ridiculous, man. Just saying that out loud. Breaky, what would you do with two million dollars? Um, I that's a tough Rather, question. Right? Unst and you can't put it in your bank account. <laughs> <laughs> put it in stocks, of course. You got it. You got to spend. You got to spend the. There's no investments. You got to spend the cash uh, on the spot. Spend the cash on the spot. I mean, you, what kind of car are you driving? Uh, I like my 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 truck that I have. My my GMC. Right, truck. I think I'm gonna get a helicopter. Simple. You're okay. I'm get a helicopter. <laughs> Escalated pretty quickly right there. I mean, you want a TI. Just... What, what do you mean? Why are you asking? You want a TI. I guess it wasn't $2 million for you. but Yeah, please. The TI-5, that's like that's like hardly even relevant <laughs> so anymore. So long ago, yeah. It was nothing. But I, how, much did I, how much did we win for that? Like, what, like 100000 each? <laughs> I think it was a little more than that. Just a, just a little more than that. But All right. Close. All right, cool. Thanks for having me, guys. Thanks yeah. for watching, everybody. Go, go, NA Dotes. Check out See a stream ya. after this, guys. Thanks, Thanks again. Man. All right. There we go. Let's make sure this is fixed. There we go. Cool. Always fun talking with him. Good guy. Um, obviously, it, it's it really is cool because, and like again, I, I hope that wasn't coming off as like an assholeish question by me, but it's like why 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 is he doing it? Because you know he doesn't need to do this, obviously, but that's a great response from him. It's like, well, who else is yeah. gonna do it? No one's really been doing it, so that's cool. Yeah, I mean, there's always been rumblings about there needs to be a league. There needs to be you know bring back the the IX DL or whatever IX Mike's league was, bring back FPL. Yeah. It's got to be some some form of in-house league. I mean, Dota started with like the TDA in-houses back in the day in Warcraft. Um, that's where a lot of the best players, you know, cut their teeth originally. So I'm super stoked. It's something that I've been thinking about and, and wanting to see happen in esports for a long time. So, uh, like I said to him, I'm, I really hope that this works out and that we get some more talent coming out of the NA region. And it's something that we constantly reference when we happen to be talking about China. It's one of their biggest reasons why you could argue they're so successful in a lot of ways. It's because of this constant developmental league that they have. Uh, so I think it is called the, the DPL over there, that, uh, specifically yep, that DPL. one. So um, that starts in October. So a yeah, little bit of time. We have TI and everything, but uh, it'll be fun to watch. All right, so we're not wrapping up just yet, though. That was uh, for PPD on the show, but uh, there are a couple of more teams that we wanted to again kind of recap their season and everything. Go over from NA. Uh, we'll jump into which one do I have next? Let's jump into Evil Geniuses. 
the great. Yeah, there's this other little team called EG, right? I never heard of them. EG, uh, evil, evil genius. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is a team that, well, things changed throughout the season. I think is a good way to put it. We we kind of even talked a little bit about it already with the optic situation. Of course, uh, misery eventually joining the squad, but. Whew. This is, uh, I'll say right off the bat, personally, <laughs> I've said it many times before, I've always felt it's been overhyped. They got invited to way too many events based on just simply their popularity, which I get from a marketing perspective, but from a results perspective, wasn't really deserving in a lot of ways. But, you know, with their newest roster, they did qualify for TA8 and uh, deservingly so. Um, who knows what to expect of them. Anyways, that, that's just kind of the, the theme, though, of the squad, I feel like. They're, they're constantly overrated. At the same time, they, they occasionally do have some really good results, too. So, I don't know what to think. I, I think that they probably should have renamed themselves to Digital Chaos because that pretty much described their entire sure. season. Uh, you know? I mean, they, they had Sumail switch roles. They got rid of Universe. Got rid of Fear. Brought in various other players to try and fill the roles. They went through, I think, multiple coaches. Um, yeah, it, it's been it's been a pretty chaotic year for the Evil Geniuses brand, and I'm sure it's been a really disappointing one for all of the players and the organization itself. Obviously, with a good showing at TI, that kind of goes all out the window. But yeah, um, it's it's been one of those seasons where if you are an EG fan, you probably have done a whole lot of wringing of your hands or. You know, just face palming or who knows, um, because it's been a very, very interesting, <laughs> interesting season. That's all I can really say. So to, to go into specifics here, as far as, again, the roster situation for them, remember, they, they officially started the season. Their roster was Arteezy, Samel, Universe, Zai, and Crit was their five-man squad. Of course, Crit was doing the captaining as he was the previous season. Um, then eventually both, well, Zai eventually joined the Dire at the time, then became Optic, of course, and Universe was removed from the team. And that that move right there, I, I, I remember talking about it and being like, this is absurd to me. Because when, when, when you also think, I was talking with several people about this at the end of last season, in fact, uh, after TI and their disappointing finish getting knocked out by Empire there, um, how they may need to kind of blow up the squad and start from scratch in a lot of ways, maybe behind one player. And there's arguments to be made for Arteezy, for Sumail, for you. Personally, I felt if you were going to kind of blow up the team and try to build around one player, I mean, I see the strong argument for Sumail as well, but I also saw one for Universe definitely as that offlane player, the solid player that he was, the, the very mature player that he is. Um, so when they announced that he was removed from the squad, it just completely threw me off. And I had no clue where where they were going uh, with that with that situation. Now we eventually found out, of course, with the replacements uh, of what happened. But it's it's still still just even talking about that sending to some mail to the off lane and fear coming back and boy, it, it did not make any sense to me. And I think we kind of saw most of that throughout the season. Yeah, I mean they they brought back fear and everybody kind of was thinking, okay, well I guess our is now going to be their mid. But then it basically ended up being fear being their mid. Uh, I mean, obviously the meta was fairly sacrificial for the mid at that point, and that's kind of, I guess, why they changed the males of the off lane because that was more of like a one on one where you could maybe outskill people. But the whole reasoning of being like, well, we gotta change something up, so let's you know get rid of our off lane or move Sumail there. Kind of that reasoning sort of fell through once they brought Sumail back to two yeah. and now have S four as their offlaner. So it, I would say that as confused as you were <laughs> about what they were doing, they, they were, were probably confused. similarly confused about what they were actually doing. They were clearly desperate. They, they, they were desperate yeah. at that time. And the ultimate goal, as many of these top players would say, is that you, know, you want to make sure you have a solid roster going into TI8 itself. But they, they were clearly just trying some crazy things. And I'm not, I'm not against the idea of being radical but at the same time, I feel like, again, going into the season, you kind of just knew it wasn't maybe – it wasn't really – they needed to do something. 
bigger going into the season, and they, they really didn't. And I think that was the biggest issue for EG, uh, especially in the earlier parts of the season, for most of it, frankly, um, and really all the way through. And, again, they happen to qualify for TI8 now because of their, their latest roster with S4 and Fly joining. That news kind of came out of nowhere in a lot of ways. But I think uh, both you and I kind of agreed, and we we have been seeing a little bit of it, maybe even with the qualifiers, that – it feels like that this was for the better for, for Evil Geniuses. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, and Fly as a captain. For me, that's the biggest thing is that Fly is a true captain. Crit has made a point for the longest time that he never really wanted to be a captain. He kind of just fell into it. Misery is a great captain himself, so it's hard to take away from him. But he did an interview after he got kicked, and he made it pretty clear that he just had trouble controlling some, like behind-the-scene relationships with the players. Um and, you know, whether that's just him as a person or whatever it is, it, and that's what was happening, it seems like to me that Fly's not a per, not a person in general that's going to take that, right? He's not going to allow for that crap to happen. He's going to be this, uh, this strong captain kind of behind the scenes as well that's going to make sure the players are doing what they need to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I thought that a lot of the reasoning for bringing in Misery was that he was kind of like a, for lack of a better word, kind of a hard ass with the players. I mean, I feel like we kind of saw that with DC. A lot of people thought that that was the effect that he was going to have. It obviously didn't happen. And I think their problem stemmed both from not having like a consistent, strong leadership captain, but more so in game stemmed from the fact that they didn't have anybody to be sacrificial. Like they had fear, but you know, he's, he's a core player. And for core players, it's hard to be sacrificial. Obviously, Arteezy is not going to be sacrificial. Sumail is not going to be sacrificial. Mm -hmm. Crit is historically a fairly greedy support. And Misery is also historically a fairly greedy support. So when you have five greedy players, you cannot function as a team in Dota because resource distribution is something that you have to do to compete at the highest level. And so when you have Fly, who actually plays the five role, and sometimes six, and you have S4 who actually makes space and doesn't just eat up farm on the map, you actually have a team that can function like a Dota team is supposed to function. So, I mean, you look at the results throughout the season, it was always just kind of very mediocre results for the most part. Um, you know, a lot of fifth, six, six uh, through seventh, or six through uh, fifth, six, seventh, eighth, I guess. Uh, and then especially, again, the finish, you know, 10th, 12th at ESL1 Birmingham. And that that's when the whole change took place after that event as far as uh, Fly and S4 joining the squad. So clearly it just it felt like it was almost getting worse in a lot of ways uh, as the season went on. But, again, it's they, they made the changes that I think a lot of people would agree is almost necessary going into the most important time now of the year. And that is uh, TIA. Now, something else I forgot to mention again is why. I just linked it in chat there. Uh, we, we do have these polls going. So if you want to vote once again as far as who you think the MVP uh, is for this squad going into TIA. Um, before we, we go over those results, though, we forgot to go over Optics results. And so quickly jumping back to that, 3-3 uh, three, three was marked as the MVP according to the community. Uh, so he got 44%. PPD was in second at 23%, but you know, pretty overwhelmingly voting 3-3 uh, three, three as the MVP for Optic and talking about their success. And, and PPD was talking about the idea that he's just a very diverse player. They can constantly build drafts around him as a player. Great mac uh, micro skills. Um, I, I think there's a strong argument, and, and personally I would have uh, I would have voted him too, actually. So I guess I agree with the community there that he was. Yeah. What about you? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think there's arguments to be made for PPD or perhaps even PyCat um, because of his stability. But I would say that that 3 3 kind of makes the Optic team what it is as far as like the the kind of heroes that he plays, the style of play that he has, and just he, he gives them the ability to do so much more. And that's not to take anything away from Zai or CC and C either because both of them. Uh, obviously can carry games as well. And, and Zai, like PBD was saying, Zai has, is a very similar to player to th uh, 33 in the fact that he's so diverse um, and can play many different roles for the team. But, I mean, I would say that based on the fact that 33 kind of carried them through the last couple tournaments with his Visage and 
uh, his brood mother and that sort of stuff, you kind of have to give it to him. So now jumping into Evil Geniuses, uh, we got uh, their their MVP or who you would vote to, to be their MVP uh, going really right now and kind of going into TI-8. Um, before each other result, I'm actually curious, who do you have for EG then? I would say, honestly, I'd probably say S4. Yeah? The, yeah. The new blood to the team? I, I, yeah, I would say S4. Well, the community agrees. They uh, they voted him similar. How about that? I mean, obviously 3-3, three, three, an offlane player. S4, an offlane player. It's offlane. Offlane's kind of interesting because it, it had a transition throughout the season where initially it was all about that solo offlaner, you know, these Beastmasters, whatever, that the Tidehunters, these kind of like heroes that can do stuff themselves, kind of win the lane even in some ways, uh, be kind of a front line or an initiator. But now it's more, I mean, it's, I guess similar heroes kind of to an extent, but it's more about these dual lanes at the same time. You know, you're playing with a partner now later parts of the season. But uh, there are a lot of these offlaners that stand out as being uh, the kind of the pacemakers for the team, I guess. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, I think the offlane is probably the most difficult role like to be consistently really good at just because it's the role that changes the most from patch to patch. At least that's been the case over the last year and a half or so. It just seems like, you know, there's changes made to the lane structure and what heroes are being run and where they're being run. And it, all of it is surrounding, you know, getting your, your one and two players to have good games, mm -hmm. which means that essentially all of your eggs are in the, carry or the mid players basket and you're trying to empower those two players to get all the farm to have all the space to make all the plays which leaves you with an offlaner who basically is just like you know eating the scraps that are left after that and sometimes those scraps are better like when he had the, sh the free shrine at the first minute of the game yeah. and sometimes those scraps are literally getting 25 percent uh, xp from denies and having to sit back at your tower and just hope that creeps will eventually come to you because your supports are helping the other two lanes and their supports are just zoning you out and so like you have to be very diverse, you have to be very tilt-proof, you have to be very adaptable, and you have to be very creative to be an offlaner. And like I said, I think that S4 is the first real space maker that this EG team has had uh, in the offlane role. I yeah. mean, you know, nothing nothing against Universe, but he was notoriously a greedy offlaner. Yeah, now S4 is, uh, you know, bringing that experience over. Of course, former TI champion himself, and... A lot of people would expect him to be a leading cause for EG success coming up to TI8. One more team to talk about, that being VGJ Storm. Now, a team that obviously they got first place in NA, so they were the top team in NA to qualify. They they qualified via the group stages and then eventually the tiebreakers that took place. But we, we've mentioned both of these squads, but already having some roster changes throughout. But VGJ Storm, more than anyone, <laughs> had some roster changes throughout this season. I mean, obviously the roster oh, yeah. that they're going with is you are resolution snaking MSS and SVG, but at the beginning of the season, get this, the roster, the roster was Ritsu, Ryoya, Snake King, Francis Lee, and Stan King. Yep. So Snake King, or we saw Francis Lee uh, and Stan King eventually go to South America on the qualifiers, trying to compete there. Ryoya, yeah, where is he? I don't even know where he is at now. <laughs> He's with Immortals. That's right. Immortals. He was with Immortals. Yeah, he played for them at that point. But basically, this it, it's <laughs> literally B a BSJ roster. played for this team. Monkeys Forever played for this That's team. That's right. And then you look at later in 2018. Tomato played for this team. I remember, where was it? It was at the uh, the perfect mat, the, the, the minor land earlier in the season that I attended. Uh, Jack was there as a commentator. Of course, he's the manager for the squad. And I just remember he, he just got news at that time as well that one of the players was leaving the squad. I think it was Ryoya. He mentioned that he was going to be leaving the squad, and, and he just felt so devastated. Like He's like, things just aren't working, man. We're, we're going through a lot of crap right now. We're just we're going to have to try to keep going through play. And he just seemed so depressed, honestly, in a lot of ways. It was just very frustrating, and I get that, obviously. With what they were I think that was Ritsu with. actually leaving. I was it? Oh, it might have been Ritsu. Yeah, yeah, okay, that makes more sense. Point is... They've been through a lot. Yeah, you look at today. You mentioned even BSJ, Monkeys Forever. Uh, they tried everything. Uh, Tomato, <laughs> even 
But, uh, oh, no, that was – no, I guess Tomato was part of the squad, technically, yeah, uh, earlier on in the season, too. But now they got this new roster. They eventually picked up Resolution, which obviously was the really big name uh, that they managed to get their hands on. And things initially weren't necessarily clicking, but at the later part of the season, it really picked up for the squad. And you could tell that you could argue that they were the top team in NA in a lot of ways. So. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, they were the, the first team to qualify for TI in the qualifiers, so I don't think it's any stretch to call them like the best team in NA. Uh, obviously, you know, Optic is certainly in the conversation. EG is certainly in the conversation. But uh, it, it's really, you know, they, they made as much progress as Optic made over the course of the year. This team also made an incredible amount of progress, albeit with different players, but just the fact that they were a team that was very, very much like a, a tier three team mm -hmm. to suddenly be considered potentially the best team in North America is a huge, huge jump. So now the question for, for this squad right here is the same as the others. Again, who is the MVP for VJ Storm right now? Personally, I I would lean towards uh, lean towards SVG. I, I think, and mainly because of the the captaining that he that he brought to the table. Uh, obviously, this is a, a very very experienced and smart player. Uh, he was the coach of Evil Geniuses before, as we've talked about before. Um, but I've also had the chance to you know actually have him on an interview after they won one of their qualifiers early on the season, and just a very down to earth guy. Uh, obviously, is very intelligent when it comes to talking Dota, especially. And uh, you, you could tell that he kind of is this cool, calm, and collected captain as well, uh, leading the team. So for, for me, I would lean towards SVG being their most successful and MVP player. Yeah, I would say that their, their MVP is Jack. <laughs> I mean, there's people out there that would say, I, I, I could see an argument for that. I mean, come on, though. It's, the players on the field have to. I would say it's Jack. Results. I mean, he. he built this team i i don't know okay so i don't know how much autonomy he has i don't know what he's like legitimately a gm like he's the you know basketball gm or whatever building the team scouting yeah. players that sort of thing i assume that's he fair. seems to have he seems to have you know full control and he had to blow up the team a couple times and bring back new players and re-sign old players and figure out a squad that would actually work and he did so he's my MVP, but if I have to choose a player, I would agree with you that it's SVG just because I think that he has the Dota brain to take the talent that's on this team and actually make them a successful and potentially uh, have them go pretty far in TI. You see the community vote right here. Resolution ends up being uh, taken. And yeah, I think this one is a little bit more of a popularity vote. Uh, of course, a very popular player. And, and the, of course, yes, this is a player that's also, again, even just last TI. He carried Empire to a crazy finish, including the defeat of Eagle Geniuses that everyone remembers. Um, is known as one of the best carry players in the scene, no doubt. But... Again, for this specific squad, yeah, I, I will lean more towards us. I think there's argument to be made, honestly, for snaking as well. He's speaking of another great offlane player, and, and a little, and one that's a little more under the radar than a lot of these big name offlane players, in my opinion. So uh, uh, definitely a big name uh, to look for there, and their success for VGJ Storm. But overall, great squad, and again, a team that uh, went through quite a bit to say the least throughout the season, but it all worked out in the end. And deservingly so, taking that first seed from NA. It, yeah, I do think that it is kind of interesting that, I mean, you would you think this would kind of be the case, I guess. But it does seem like all three of these NA teams that we talked about are kind of in that spot where they appear to be peaking mm -hmm. at the right time. Like, all of them started out much weaker at the early stages of the season and have gotten to a place where they seem to be playing their best Dota. Um, and I only say that, you know, because there are some some teams that may have sort of, you know, fallen off a little bit towards the end of the season because they had already qualified or were more inconsistent. But but all three of these teams seem to be kind of like building towards towards something. Mm -hmm. Now the ultimate question, I uh, posted in the chat as well. Which of these NA teams will have the best results at TI8? This really is a tough question, and I could see a strong argument for all three. There's really no great, right answer, in my opinion. 
with that said, personally, I'm not going to make the same mistake I made in the NA qualifiers where I picked Complexity over VGJ Storm. I thought they were going to be the one team <laughs> out, and Complexity was going to sne sneak in with Optic and EG. Wasn't the case. VGJ Storm not only qualified, but again, they did so very dominantly in the group stages. I mean, they did have to go through tiebreakers, so it wasn't crazy dominance necessarily, but they did look very good. And uh, I think the leadership, like I said, of SVG, the drafts that he comes up with, and overall great play. And, of course, you have resolution in that core. Uh, you are very solid himself. They're going to be the team that finishes the and has the deepest run, in my opinion, from NA. Yeah, this is a really tough question. I mean, I can see merits for picking any of these three teams. And, man, I'm just – I'm going to go with EG just because I feel like on paper they have the best – potentially they have the potential to be the best at one through five. Yeah, that's fair. That's that's a very fair argument, actually, because you're not wrong there. <laughs> you look at all five of their players. And... Like they haven't shown it necessarily, but I think potentially on paper they have the best to to have the number one one through five player at the tournament. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, as usual, they will have some of the most pressure on them uh, going into this event because of the name and everything and who they are. So there's that taking consideration too, but. You know, even as PPD was talking about, hell, their TI5 run was well, lucky in a lot of ways. It sometimes does come down to that, just depending on where you get placed yep. in the bracket, what that meta currently looks like at TI, if that's something that you're very comfortable with or not. And um, not to say it's the teams that win in the end aren't aren't truly deserving, but uh, it's not it's not a hundred percent skill necessarily. There is a little bit of luck involved on top of that. But uh, sure enough, it's funny. You pick EG, I pick Storm, and the community overwhelmingly picks Optic <laughs> in the end. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think that any of those are incorrect. Yeah, Just... yeah, I don't think they are either. And it, something tells me we have a lot of Optic fans tuning in, maybe because of PPD being on earlier. So that's fair too. But again, there's there's no wrong answer for this one. They they all absolutely have uh, their own reasons as to why they could go deep in the event, but. Elevated. I think we made it. This is one of our longer shows, but uh, yeah, thank I think it was worth it though. PPD's yeah. interview was great. I was just gonna say thanks to PPD, but no, it's it's always, it's always good. Yeah, it's a great content from him, and happy it went a little bit longer than that being the case. But our wrapping up. Anything else from you before we do? No, I'm uh, I'm just excited to you know just kind of relax a little bit and get hyped up for TI and talk talk some more team the next week, man. Yeah, not exactly sure which region we're going to jump into next week, but that'll be the plan. So this is a weekly show. At least uh, that's the idea. Again, the Dota Procast here. Um, leading up to TI8, we are going to be previewing uh, more and more, pretty much all the regions, ideally, all the way into TI8. And then, of course, the event itself, once things like the format and everything comes out. Um, so, yeah, next week's show. Who knows? Maybe we'll have more news. If anything, maybe preview a little bit more of Summit 8, or Summit 9, excuse me. That'll be happening then the following week. Get some more information from that. But uh, it's it's going to get busier and busier as these weeks get on. That's uh, the point of getting at again. But thank you, as always, for tuning in, guys. I was Breaky CPK, joined by Elevated. Have a good night. We will see you next time here on the Dota Procast. Be sure to check out us, us out on YouTube as well on SoundCloud. We'll see you next week. Thanks again to Don't PPD. Don't forget Bot TI. Bot <laughs> TI. Yeah, do not forget that. That's happening too.